Hi everybody, hope you're well and welcome to my next edition of Match Memories. Like I mentioned in the last one, going back to Spain, it seemed like I had to do it after looking through all the memorabilia. Um, it really was an important, not just learning curve um, and a difficult venue to fish, but it just seemed too important to miss. And the venue that I'm going to go over next and the match, which is a European Championships, <clears throat> When I've looked back through everything, I would say, and I know other members of the team would back me up here, that it was probably the most technical venue I've ever encountered, and also the team as well. And the venue I'm talking about is Carouche in Portugal. You may have heard me mention this in, in a past video about being extremely hot. Um, a little bit like Spain. Uh, very, very sort of desolate match length no trees uh, just sand unbelievably hot like 40 degrees plus but fantastic fishing now when we arrived at Cruz, and it's a venue that i've been to before i know alan and stevie have been there before um i think it was back in 90 not too sure 95 96 something like that maybe even before that um but i know stevie and Alan had been there on the World Championships previously. It's a fantastic venue. And it is a venue, a little bit like I've said before as well, that, you know, comes along every few years. We were meant to be there this year for the Europeans, but obviously all world events are, are, are cancelled. So it just shows you that, again, using the little black book, got plenty of information here on Karush. Um Let's see if I can find it. Cabasal, which is another venue very close to there. Uh, yeah, Portugal Carouche, page 20. Now, having looked back through the memorabilia um, and various other things and thought about it, it was one that I definitely wanted to do because the fishing turned out to be not only extremely enjoyable when you twigged and you, you found out exactly what to do, but very, very, very technical. Um, when I look back, the pole was a different matter. Um, but what I'm going to do first of all is describe the venue a little bit. Like I've already said, there's no trees, no shade. It's just sand banks, both banks. It's around about six to seven foot deep and it's uniform all the way along. Basically, it's just like a sand gully that's filled up with water. Now, the one difference with Karush is, bearing in mind what I've said, if you're going to go for two weeks, you have to practice over 500 meters off the max length and Karush is in a massive max length so we couldn't get on the venue however there is a venue St Augusta not too far away from it that isn't the same by any means but very similar um, you can get your rods set up you can get your wagglers right um, you can catch some fish on the pole very similar a few more mullet in St Augusta but you know Karush was going to be mainly barbel um, with some borger Again, the fish that I mentioned when, when I went over Portugal before the rowing course in Montema. Um It's like a big gudgeony dace type fish. Beautiful fish, ever so strong. Um, and willing to feed in these real hot climates. So it's going to be barbel, borger, maybe a very, very odd mullet, but hardly any. And uh, again, the information was there before. Um, three, four kilos have been doing well in the Portuguese trials. So... Arriving at, at the venue again immediately the first thing that hits you when you get out of a nice air-conditioned van is wall It's like hitting a brick wall this heat um, And you have to be prepared you have to have canopies for your bait You know you could put a handful of maggots in a bait box leave it in the Sun and within two minutes They were just dead and obviously it's little things like this that you just can't afford to happen in the match or in the practice sessions for, for that so bait umbrellas umbrellas canopies to cover any kind of shade um that you could get you know was of utmost importance so getting your setup right before you go and i'm a massive fan no matter where i'm going whether it's i don't know bow beach or, or or wherever but if i know roughly the setup i want i have it up in the tackle room getting everything right you know making sure everything's in the right place so when i arrive at the venue i can start to really concentrate on what's important and that's figuring out how to catch these fish so we went to st augusta the week before um 
Again, we went on the overnight ferry down to Santander. Uh, I think we arrived on about the Tuesday, I believe. So we had Wednesday, Thursday, Friday practicing at, at St. Augustine. That unofficial practice week before the serious, serious week starts is fantastic, especially in this heat, because you want to take the pressure off yourself. You want to prepare as much gear as you can. Um, and by that, I mean rods made up. You know, we've got the ready-made rod bags now. Um, you know, we had five, six, seven, eight rods made up. Now, Karush really is pole and fixed waggler. You would think slider would work, but these barbel, they don't like lead down the line. They want it all nice and free. And at St. Augusta, we did catch a few fish. We caught some borger on the pole and very small barbel and a very odd barbel fishing across. But like I say, more importantly, you know, you're firing out little balls of sticky mag just this side of your float and fishing just past it and moving your float into it. But this is something I'm really going to go in depth because it's fascinating when you hear how we actually uh, got on the right lines and fine-tuned it and, and, you know, went very, very close as a team. So St. Augusta, the unofficial week, was a very good week. We had all the gear right, catapults right. I was using a little Drenner maggot catapult just to ping these balls of sticky mag. Hardly any stones, you wanted it to literally hit the surface and skip a little bit, almost like skimming stones, and you could see it breaking up, creating a nice area. So, going on to the official week, and this is where things, you know, took a little bit of a turn, and we were all told, and I believe it was Alan that said when they were there before, the week started off very, very slow, and Monday was certainly no different. Um... I think Alan had one fish or maybe even blanked. I know I had one barbel. Uh, I think Stevie won the session with three or four small barbel. It was very, very difficult. By the way, the team is obviously me and Stevie travelling together. Um, you had Sean and Darren Cox was in the squad and in the team this, this year. Um, fantastic addition. Brilliant angler at, at, at a multitude of things. Um, then you obviously had Alan and Steve Hemingway travelling together. Fantastic team uh, for running line waters. Uh, Steve Hemingway, one of the best anglers I've ever seen. Not only just with the pole, but put a slider in his hand and a catapult. And you've job to find anyone better, more efficient and certainly more accurate. So a brilliant, brilliant addition. And Steve's gone on to be a major, major linchpin, so to speak, of the team. Um, but all the lads... Very, very adapt to all styles, but we had very, very strong six there for this waggler fishing that was definitely going to play a massive, massive part. So like I say, the Monday didn't go to plan at all. No bites on the pole. Um, I remember I caught one barbel on the waggler. Literally casting right across, winding it in, using the census line mark, winding it in, about 35 metres we were fishing. And that way, with the mark, you could wind it to the top of the rod and know you were fishing just past your bait. And by this time, we'd realised that you could have all your rods set the same. I was using 13-foot Darwin Match Winner rods, 4-pound Maxima mainline, 012 fluorocarbon hook length, but a metre and a half. Remember what I said, these barbel, they don't like line down. They don't lead down the line. They don't like to pick the bait up and move and obviously feel some resistance. They drop the bait immediately. Um... So all our rods were set up for fishing 12 foot deep, including the length of your float, so probably closer to 13 foot. I've actually got my box of wagglers here that are all still absolutely perfectly shotted up from when I was there. So very little shot down the line. You can see here, these floats basically... You can see in a nice box that a guy from Italy made me. All that's to do is to put the tips on. Now, every one of these floats will take a swivel, obviously, to hold the float on the line. Five line stops, two above, three below, and then a swivel down the line. No shot down the line at all. And we're using 012. One's just popped out there. I'll sort that out in a minute. No problem. But... Again, nice and organised, keeps it out the sun, and that's a massive thing. When you're fishing in these real hot countries, you have to be very, very aware that your gear can be affected, your line, your floats, everything can be affected, your pole elastics especially. 
can be affected by this heat and it's about hiding it you know normally when I plumb up put the rig on I've just pulled like however much elastic out and put the hook on the end of the number four this time it was literally loop plumb up get it right and loop the line around leaving all the elastic in the pole section you had to do it you had to preserve your gear else you'd be changing your elastics your line even the catapults you know the elastic on the catapults you had to sort of um you know be aware that that they weren't going to last forever so just by using them putting them in this out the way on your side tray like i say in the shade under your umbrellas was a massive massive part so there's a lot of little things to think about here you know match preparation um it, it is massive when you're fishing in this heat because you need to keep your bait alive you need to keep your gear in tip-top condition as well as thinking about what you're doing but where it all became interesting Tuesday was much of a muchness, very, very difficult. But Wednesday, the Portuguese were catching some fish. And Mark Downs walked up to us and said, have a little walk down there, you know, in the middle of the session. Have a little walk down there and see what they're doing. Now, I was fishing a waggler, casting out, rod tip under the water, winding in like that. Float would go under, you'd strike, nothing. And you would get an odd indication. Even that first day, I only caught one barbel, but I had seven or eight indications. And I remember it was me and Alan that walked down there and we stood back in the bushes and we were just sat, stood there watching the, the uh, Portuguese fish. Now, bearing in mind, this is their home venue. You know, they, they fished it for a lot of years when the World Championships was there. They dominated it, had individual winner. And it was, again, one of those venues that the home nation had handpicked to obviously do very well on. Now, we stood there and this one guy, uh, I can't remember... Who, who who he was, but he cast right across, literally 50 odd metres. He stood up and he put his rod right down, unbelievable at that kind of angle. And so his rod tip was almost touching the water, uh, touching the bottom, sorry, on the water in front of him. And he just wound slow and you could see him looking for his line mark, very similar to us. And then when his float when he got to his line mark, he stopped and held his rod tip on the bottom in front of him, almost leaning out, like, to get it as far down as he could. And he watched, and his float popped up, then he let his bail arm off, and let line out, and then just put it on a rest, which was situated at just, you know, 40 odd degrees, so that he could just literally just watch his tip. And it was set on a butt rest and a front rest. And we're watching him, and I'm like... Blimey, you know, like he's taking utmost importance to get that line sunk. The setup, the float, the depth, everything else looked exactly the same. And I was sat there and I was watching his float and his float went under. And I'm like, strike then. And he just looked at his rod tip. His float came back up and he just wound real slow. And you saw his float just go start to move and he'd stop and now his line's tight and his float went and he looked at his rod tip and his float came back up and then he wound and his float just moved towards him a tiny bit and once it started to move he stopped and then the next thing was like unbelievable like you reek i can't believe it his float's gone under and he's looked at his rod tip and i saw his rod tip just go he just picked up and played this barbling. And I said to Alan, oh my God, you know, like, so literally gone back. Oh, one other thing that happened, when he landed this barbel, immediately picked up washing up liquid on his spool of his reel, makes your line sink. Again, rebated, checked everything, cast right across. Now, a few things, obviously, by sinking your line, treating it with, obviously, a sinking agent, like washing up liquid your presentation is going to be massive and i've already told you that these barbels are quite spooky they pick it if you've got lead down they don't like it they drop your bait but also another thing that really really scared these barbels was your float landing you're using 14 16 gram floats when that float lands the fish don't like it so what this guy was doing was casting miles across his float would land and he'd retrieve it really slow into his fed area and everything was like stealth mode so to speak absolutely fantastic gone back there and it's like right where's the local shop washing up liquid 
blah, 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 blah. And then Thursday, we sorry, Wednesday night, we sat and talked, and me and Alan had said what we'd seen, and, and, and this, that, and the other. And the next day, we caught loads of fish, and it just clicked. It was like, you can't believe that you can do it similar, but slightly different, and catch hardly anything. And you can change two or three little things, casting across, treating your line, when your float hits your clip, because you're chucking out to a clip and then winding to your line mark, rod tip right down low, as low as you can, and wind and wind and wind. And the most important thing then, which I felt was unbelievably important, was what I said about the bail arm. When that float, when, when your line mark comes into your eyes, stop, and your float pops up, let your bail arm off, because if you don't, your rod tip's so low that when you move it up, you can move your float and create a bit of slack. And it was all about keeping that line tight, which is why that guy, when his float went under and his rod didn't go round and it popped back up, he'd just wind really, really slow, really slow. And his float would just start to edge towards him and he'd stop, so he's got a tight line. So when one takes it properly, it pulls the rod. You're maximising the amount of time in the water. Now you can see really why I wanted to talk about this because it is a very, very technical venue and a way of fishing. I just want to talk a little bit about the pole. Um, as the week went on, certainly Thursday, Friday, there was a few fish on the pole, borger, small barbel. And the way we fed this was to feed 13 metres, um, was where you were actually fishing. So we're cupping in five or six balls of ground bait. Um, I think we used uh, gross gardon about a metre short of the pole tip, and loose feeding maggots. And one thing we found was you got a lot of indications. By this time, as what normally happens, the venue started filling up with fish. Like the locals said it would, and all credit to them, they got it absolutely bang on. The venue started filling up with fish, more and more fish coming into the match length. Not loads of bites on, on, on the waggler, but nice barbel. You know, half a kilo, or pound, pound and a half, with an odd bigger one and an odd smaller one. So... But one thing was noticeable on the pole was we were loose feeding hemp and maggots on the pole and on the waggler just sticky mag. And the waggler we had, you know, dead right. But on the pole you get a lot of indications, um, miss a few bites but still catch a few fish and we were happy just loose feeding hemp and maggots. But something happened to me the first day um, which, you know, I think was was a massive something sort of by accident but that's something i'll go into so the team was picked unfortunately darren didn't make the team the first day um sean myself stevie allen and steve hemingray we fished and i want to forward wind a little bit I, I will tell you the results and how the team did and 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 the individuals um but something happened to me that first day and i drew right in the middle of the set uh, I was about four or five from the end, um, but right in the middle of the match length. And I caught a few fish on a waggler. I was doing really nice, you know, like really happy. It was really difficult. But what I was doing was loose feeding these hemp and maggots on the pole. And with about an hour to go, again, three hour match. With about an hour to go, I've gone in on the pole. Float's gone under. Bump. Got one. Nice borger. Three or four ounce. Dropped it in again, it's gone straight under, I've got another one, so I've loose fed. Gone out then, and immediately I'm like, blimey, I haven't been loose feeding far enough. I'm like half a metre short. Oh, well, oh, there seems to be some fish there. Anyway, dropped it in, whoosh, missed the bite. Dropped it in again, whoosh, missed the bite. Loose fed, dropped it in again, and my float's like, missed the bite. And I thought, hang on a minute, I've been loose feeding short. And I had the first two or three put-ins, it just went straight under and caught a fish. So immediately I started loose feeding my maggots and hemp a metre short on my pole tip, caught a fish every single chuck in and won my section. And it's little things like that, noticing little things like that, added together with everything that we'd sort of seen from, from the Portuguese. And you know in the past when I spoke about teams like Russia and Holland, you know, copying us, um, Tamas seeing what we were doing in, in, in Portugal at Montemar and, 
and doing the same and winning the world champs. It's these little things that you have to notice and you have to, more importantly, go on the look for. Um, you know, it's all too easy to sit there thinking that, you know, the venue's bad or this, that and the other, but there's always a way to catch more fish. And Karush was, you know, unbelievably, you know, the best example I can think of this. I could sit you there and you could fish and you'd get a very odd fish. And I could tell you three or four little things, like I've already mentioned with that waggler to do, and your catch rate will increase tenfold. Unbelievable. So anyway, at the meeting that night, uh, Alan had won his section, I'd won mine, uh, Stevie was second, uh, Steve Hemming Gray and Sean were about sixth or seventh. Darren actually came in the next day for the team. Um, I think we scored about 18 points and we were right up there. Uh, Portugal, obviously, notoriously hard to beat in Portugal. Just fantastic anglers at that style of fishing. Italy had done quite well as well the first day. But more importantly, going on to the team meeting, you can imagine I can't wait. And a few of the lads spoke first and I said, right, something's happened to me today. And, you know, I, I, I make no bones about it. I, I made a mistake by feeding too short. When I was fishing a waggler and I'm loose feeding hemp and maggots on my pole, I've just been dropping it too short. When I went on it, I caught a fish every chuck. And as soon as I started loose feeding, you know, my floats there and loose feeding on top of my float, it just went to nonsense, missed bites. So we've got to loose feed short. And that's something that not only paid off for me again the second day, but Alan also. So the second day, again, got to my peg. I had a Portuguese angler, two to my left. At Mary, I had a real good battle with him. Um, I caught really well on the waggler. I caught two or three decent fish. But um, the pole, again, the last hour, dropped in. And it was just unbelievable. Loads of people are getting a bite every chuck and catching a fish every third or fourth chuck whereas I was getting a bite every chuck and catching a fish every chuck very very important you know to, to feed in the right place you know you don't you, feeding is one thing but where you put your rig in your peg in relation to the feed is a completely different thing um, and it just goes to show sometimes even when you're fishing for a lot of fish fishing on the outskirts of your bait whether it's left, whether it's right, whether it's past, sometimes even closer, um, you know, can be a massive, massive thing because your bait's very close to the fish, very close to the to the nucleus of bait, but just past it on its own, and they can single it out, and you get a lot, lot less bother. Second day, I managed to win my section again. Brilliant finish on the pole, beating the Portuguese lad by about 900 grams. I think he was second in the section. Alan won his section again. The team had a little bit of an indifferent day. Um, we ended up second as a team. Portugal winning it with 30 points. We had 32. We were a little bit unlucky. Drew a couple of hardish areas. Um, Stevie having a fish um, not allowed again uh, for going out of his zone. Nothing to do with him. Again, you know, he's hooked a decent barbel. I think it was about three pound. An unusually big fish. Um, and it's just kited left or right. And there was an angler on the pole. And that was the end of that. And that fish probably would have won us the event. But, you know, that happens a lot. Stevie did fantastically well, as, as always, both days. Um, but a few special things happened that week. Um, obviously... Myself, it was the second time I'd been second in the European Championships. Luckily, by this time, I'd managed to win it. Um, but Alan made history once again. He became the first angler ever, and I still think he's the only angler to do it, um, to win the World Club Championships individually, the World Championships individually, and now, more importantly, to round off the collection of medals, he won the European Championships individually. Beating the Portuguese angler by little less than a couple of ounces a second day. Um, and it's things like that, when you look at results like that, that every single little detail matters. You know, and that's why Alan's won what he's won. And that's why all the guys that are in the England team are in the England team, because they make no mistakes, they leave no stone unturned. And that's something that I take into my domestic fishing and that you should too, 100%. Go into detail. You know, go analyse everything. If you're not sure, go and watch someone that you know is catching fish and doing really well. You know, make that effort and analyse what people are doing. And also, be prepared 
you know, to get you set up right before you go. Time saved before you go is, is more time on the bank to either go and watch, try, you know, and experiment. And don't be afraid to copy people. A lot of the matches I've won domestically, you sat there after an hour thinking, oh, he's catching on this. Oh, I'll set that up and you win the match. And that's a massive, massive thing. Keeping your eyes and keeping your ears open when you're fishing. Not just tunnel vision, doing what you're doing. You have to glean information off everyone. And that little walk that me and Alan had on that Wednesday nearly, nearly paid off for us team-wise. But luckily for us, we had first, Alan obviously won the European Championships individually. I was second and the other lads did really well. And we pushed one of the hardest teams to beat on their home soil, Portugal, right to the wire. Really, really unlucky, you know, not, not to beat them. So like I say, I've got a couple of, again, a bit of memorabilia. There's me and Alan there. Alan with his European Championships winner's trophy and gold medal and a silver medal as we were second as a team and I'm there with double silver double gold's better but double silver will do um one little funny story I want to end on uh and I'm not going to get too graphic when I go into this story um but on the second day I make no bones about it I had a little bit of a funny tummy which you can do when you go to to certain places it's the water or you know, just brushing your teeth in the morning, you get the water. But uh, 40 degrees heat, and I definitely didn't have the best stomach in the world. Luckily, I had a port -a -loo right behind me. Um, and the second day, as the match finished, again, my dad was there and this, that and the other, and I was busting for a wee. So I've run to the port -a -loo, and it's 40 degrees, you're sweating, and you literally have like one wee a day, that's it, you know. So I've gone for a while, I was like, oh, right, yeah, come out, started packing up, and my stomach's gurgling and bubbling, and I'm like, oh, God. And I've weighed in, and then this guy's come down in these, like, official-looking track suits, and, uh, Mr. Ray's, and I'm like, yeah, oh, you've got to come with us for a drugs test. Drugs test? Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, I had to leave all my gear there. My dad was packing it up and various other people. Gone for this drugs test. Now, unbeknown to me, it just involves weeing in a little jar, putting the top on, and then they do these quick little, I think they're swabs or dips or whatever, and then you can go. And 40 degrees heat, been sweating all day. I can't produce a sample. Just can't. Sorry, I just... You know, so this guy's giving me bottles of water and I'm drinking it and they're all looking official and I've been told the presentation isn't happening. Look, Alan's won it, you're second, the team's second, Portugal have won it. The presentation isn't happening until you get this sample and the tests are done. So I'm now I'm drinking water. This guy gave me a fizzy drink, drinking beer, and out my stomach I'm like, oh my God, you know, like... Woof. Oh, no, you know, like, I can go to the toilet, but it's not going to be a, a wee, you know, and you need this sample. And in the end, I thought, yeah, I, I, I can go now. So I've gone in this cubicle, and unbeknown to me, followed by this guy that has to witness that it's you weeing in the sample thing. And now I'm, like, looking at him thinking, well, I can't do one without the other, and... I said, can you just wait outside? I said, because my stomach's really bad. Um, and when I have a wee, I'm, you know, at, no, 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 I have to see, I have to see. So, you know, I don't think he enjoyed the next couple of minutes. I certainly didn't. But he got his sample. Um, just another little funny story that happens along the way. Um, I've actually had two or three drug tests, and it's good in a way. Um that, you know, it's seen that it's being taken that professional, um, that, you know, people are being drug tested and that. I'm all for things like that. Um, all of the three drug tests I've done have come back completely negative. So, um, you know, nothing to worry about there. But just a little funny story. Another one of those things that happens along the way. Um, but a fantastic week and a fantastic weekend. And a privilege to be there to watch Alan make history once again. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I'm going out fishing myself again 
probably most evenings. The season's opening soon. Can't wait to get out on the rivers. Really looking forward to it. So until next time, keep catching those fish. Look after yourself and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.